Um, the first keynote uh, this morning is by Professor Louise Archer from uh, UCL, and I'd just like to say a few words uh, about Louise, because indeed I've been following her research for a very, very long time, uh, and her research has uh, has had many facets uh, over over the years, uh, starting out by focusing on educational inequality, identities and inequalities, particularly in relation to gender, ethnicity, and social class. Uh, she's undertaken studies on the topics such as British Muslim student identities and educational experiences, working class access and non-participation in higher education, the factors behind British Chinese students' educational success, urban students who are at risk of dropping out of schooling, and more recently, research on inequalities in science participation. Louise is the Karl Mannheim Professor of Sociology of Education at UCL, Institute of Education, and co-chair of the Sociology Activity Group. Um, previously, she was a professor of Sociology of Education at King's College London, uh, where she also directed the Center for Research in Education, Science, Technology, Engineering, uh, and Maths. And we have other people from uh, UCL here, I should say, uh, uh, as well, and uh, very strong links between the RN10 uh, Network Sociology of Education uh, and UCL, including annual Erasmus teaching visit, um, staff exchanges, um, and the like. So it's, it's, uh, it's great to have also our keynote speaker from UCL this morning. Uh, Louise has now moved on uh, to a, a very large uh, national project, including a 10-year ESRC-funded Aspires uh, study, which is a mixed method longitudinal tracking of student science and career aspirations from age 10 to 11. The Enterprising Science Project, which is a five-year research and development project focusing on students from socially disadvantaged communities. And she's the UK uh, principal investigators of the Youth Equity and STEM project, which is a four-year UK-US project that focuses on youth equity in informal educational settings. Um, and she's very passionate about social justice approaches to education and to the potential for academic research to make a difference to educational policy and practice. And in this vein, her um, presentation this morning, her keynote this morning, is entitled Sociology of Education and Justice, Putting Praxis into Practice, question mark. So without further ado, if Louise is able to share uh, her screen with us and can, can hear me, um, I'd like to warmly uh, invite her to give the uh, keynote uh, today in our, in our conference. Louise, you're very welcome. We're delighted to have you with us uh, today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Daniel. That's really kind. I'm going to try and get the technology to work. Uh, here we go. Right. Hopefully, hopefully this will um, come up now. There we go. Hopefully, everyone can see the screen there. Great. So it's it's lovely to be able to uh, talk to you virtually today. Thank you for the invitation. And as Daniel said, I'm going to try and think about the capacity for sociology of education to make a difference, because that's something that we're interested in in our research. So I'll be sharing examples from some of our work there and look forward to having a discussion about it. So everyone knows there's a long history. I mean, social justice is the key theme within sociology of education. It's really core and drives a lot of what we do. Um, and there have been so many important contributions over the years to, to our understanding of the nature, the experience and the impact of inequalities in all forms of education. But I think it's fair to suggest that the, while there's a very strong conceptual impact and academic impact, impact beyond academia has been more variable and sometimes more limited, particularly in the sense of how much policy and practice takes on what we, what we find and think it puts into practice. So I'd like to reflect on well, why is it so hard for our excellent research in sociology of education to make a difference? I suppose one factor is that there are differing views on what the role of sociology of education should be. So, for example, um, Michael Apple talks about sociology of education as being the critical secretary to society. So the idea that sociology of education can help uh, what, what Bourdieu termed shine a spotlight on the blinkers. The idea that we show up inequalities, um, expand understanding, and, and then that's the role. Stephen Ball, I think, has talked about um, the importance of a sort of non-redemptive sociology that, you know, is it our role to try and interfere 
in policy and practice or do we just come up with the knowledge and then it's for others to interpret that and do with it what they will so that's one aspect another as uh, definitely i'd say characterized a lot of my own research is that often sociology doesn't offer simple easy answers often the answer is it's all very complex so it's a, a, socio a typical sociology joke i'd say but that complexity is important because the world is complex but equally it makes it more difficult to translate into policy and practice the third bullet point there um, are some slightly harsher critiques i'd say uh, critiques that have suggested that our discipline may be too distant and unwilling or unable to work effectively with policy uh, that it fails to address important issues i'm not sure i actually agree with that one that can be myopic or irrelevant because it's written in arcane and incomprehensible language so I, I think there is, um, I think these are harsh, but I think there's kernels of truth there. I think, we'll, I'll come back to this point later, but the idea of language can be an issue. That's not to say I don't see a place for, um, let's say complex and sophisticated academic language and terminology, because I think there is a place for that. But the lack of a common language, I think is an issue. Um, a lot of our work isn't produced in a format uh, that's easily, translatable or digestible. We also don't have a whole load of fora uh, for developing understanding between research and practice. And by that, I don't just mean um, how we convey our results to others, but how we create those really important, meaningful relationships of trust. Um, I'll come back to this an example later, but I know that working with um, a range of policy organisations, in our, our case, it's taken quite a number of years to build that mutual understanding and that trust. And for us to understand what sorts of outputs we can translate our work into that can be understood. And some theoretical frameworks don't easily lend to the, the, uh, the preference for, let's say, bullet point policy and practice. So, for example, Bourdieu and Bourdieu's language and, and what people talk about, the pessimism of Bourdieu. Again, that's a debatable point, but there's often generally an idea that uh, Bourdieu's work, as an example of uh, a key sociology of education theorist, is inherently slightly pessimistic and doesn't uh, lend to a lot of ideas for change. But it's very good on social reproduction and how that happens. So taking this idea of practice and how do we talk about it in practice? So the first point is uh, one made by Brosnan and it's actually in, in relation to art and artists, but I think it can be extended to the context of, uh, of academic work as well. And this idea that supplying answers to the world's problems is a danger for anyone, since answers have the embarrassing habit of looking irrelevant in a very short time, while the original questions retain their relevance. Uh, I think we see that around us all the time with the, the pandemic at least as well. So I don't think that practice is necessarily about supplying answers. Um, there are many different conceptualizations of it. As you see here, I'm using it to refer to the integration, not separation of theory and practice in the production of personal and collective learning that's inherently tied to social action. So taking sort of a, a Paolo Ferrarian um, position of practice as reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. So I think it's important to say here that I'm not framing this as some sort of utopian or redemptive project. It's not about trying to save people from educational problems. Rather, I think that we can think about practice as enacting our, our research through a politics and principle of service so social justice orientated collective endeavor enacted through partnership in the service of others so the idea of sociology of education being a tool that we can use uh, as part of social action so in this way i'm suggesting that it can be it's important that uh, to think of the discipline as being conducted with not on or for diverse communities there's a steady growth in what Boyer in the US has termed engaged scholarships, this idea of connecting you know, our, our privileged, rich resources in universities to pressing uh, societal challenges and problems. And this idea that universities can become staging grounds for action, so sort of picking up on those themes that uh, Patrick introduced at the start there. So for me, practice is about trying to make a difference, this notion of service, not saving, research through partnership and mutual learning. And I'll have some examples of how we try, I wouldn't say we're entirely successful, how we try to put these principles into practice in our own research too. I think even, um, I do often use Bourdieu, um, 
and even I, I would say, you know, trying to reconcile the idea of uh, praxis with Bourdieu has been has been interesting. But even within Bourdieu's work, I think there are hints there. So you know, he talks about the change in the field being not only possible but inevitable. So there is even in even in let's say Bourdieu as an archetypical pe pessimistic uh, uh, theorist, the idea of change is inevitable. And although fields are reproductive, they're not uniform. So there's always spaces, which I would link to Gramsci's idea that no hegemony is absolute. There's always potential for change, for resistance and for action. And I've also been um, very influenced here by the, some of the black feminist work on the radical potential of hope and love. And I think these, uh, well, particularly in the current times, these, these feel like really important and useful concepts. Uh, ways of thinking otherwise, there's always spaces for resistance um, to try and make a difference. And that, the importance of challenging politics of representation, even if they feel so powerful and entrenched. Um, and I think even if changes are small and constrained by time and space, that doesn't make them any less valuable or important. So I'm going to outline three ways uh, that we try and put these sorts of ideas into practice with policy and practice. So the first will be about partnership working, the second about conceptual tools, and the third about creative outputs. So the first point about partnership working. So for a long time now, we've been trying to very much work in partnership with a whole range of policymakers and professionals, so from teachers, through to young people, informal science educators, and as Daniel said at the start, over the last 10, 11 years, we've been working a lot in the context of science, both formal in schools and colleges and universities and informal out of school science settings like clubs, zoos, science centres and the like. Um, if, if you want to study inequalities, science is really uh, an interesting area because it's absolutely rife with inequalities. It's almost like any subject area but ramped to the max uh, with issues of elitism and privilege coming into that. So for, for us, it's a, a really um, important area to look at. And we like to adopt these, these research practice, practice partnerships so that we don't just do the research and then tell others about it afterwards, but it's through, they're threaded through from the way we even come to think about the projects, we're doing it with, with our partners, through to how we do them, run them, how we analyse data and through to outputs and, and so on. And these have been really generative um, dialogic spaces which we've learnt a lot from. We find that our learning from our policy and practice partners is as much, if not more important than, than the other way around as well. So they have sort of helped us to highlight injustice, injustices and work more collaboratively to identify more potentially socially just alternatives. So just a, a couple of examples of, so we've worked for a long time with the Institute of Physics. Um, and as I was saying, it, this, these sort of relationships take time. You often need to create the fora in which you can have these uh, exchanges. And I remember a couple of years after we started working with them, sitting at a meeting and uh, a representative from the Institute of Physics saying, well, you know, we can, telling the rest of the media, well, we can listen to Louise now because we've worked with her for years. We trust her now. We understand the sociologist. So I would say sociology wasn't immediately well known about uh, at the start as having anything to offer. Um, I think sometimes it can be viewed by external uh, organisations as sort of maybe slightly suspicious, well, you know, what, what, they up to, what what they got to offer, but over time we come to understand them and they come to understand us and, it, and it's helped us work more productively to the point where the Institute of Physics now have talked about how they've um, moved away from more deficit approaches. They used to in their words, it would say have interventions aimed at trying to encourage more girls into physics because there are very, very few girls in post in physics. And their approach before would kind of blame girls as being the problem. And now they recognise that actually it's about changing the structures and the practices which create those gendered inequalities. So, so for us, those kind of relationships are, are really important. Um, we've worked with partners like the Department of Education and um, Bays uh, as well for a number of years and last year we were having or the year before we were having a, um, a research practice partnership meeting and there was a joyful moment for me when there were representatives from all of these science organizations and from the DfE and Bayes having a conversation about Borgia, Habitus, Capital and Field between themselves which I would suggest without having engaged with our project that would never have happened but it, it as a sociologist of education it was a joyful moment for me. Um, 
We've also done a lot of collaborative work over time with primary and secondary teachers at developing, um, co-developing a teaching approach for a more socially just way of teaching science in schools. And we work with young people a lot as well on our projects. So for example, um, our Youth Equity and STEM project, um, which is a four year UK US project, works with a range of partners. And in all of our, our workshop meetings, we have researchers, we have um, informal science practitioners, so from our partner organisations, the zoos, the science centres, the clubs and so on. And we also have young people because they're important. So they're part of the way we analyse our data and make sense of it and, and run the project. And we also generally in our research, uh, across all our research teams, we have a young a youth research advisory group. They chose the name themselves and they give us insights across all of our projects and tell us what they think of how we're doing and what we should be looking at and how we interpret it and, and so on. Just a couple of uh, images there. So the, the first one, the, the sort of greeny one is um, a teacher handbook that we co-wrote with one of the secondary teachers we're doing on the primary at the moment. And then here is a few of our young people from our um, research consultants panel. Um, and in this little still, they were recording videos for what they think about the big PISA uh, science tests that lots of countries um, buy into. And they're, obviously they were talking about science and talking about their critiques of their experiences of school science. And they not only inform us, but we've taken those to a context like the PISA governing board and, and places like that, uh, which is really um, important, I think, to actually hear those young people and get their voices into those spaces and to make often these sort of quite what seem like abstract dry policy discussions real. Um, and those are young people from, from local schools that we work with, we, schools in less privileged circumstances. And the final image there is just a few of our um, informal science learning practitioners that we work with. Um, looks like we always work with them in the sunshine, not always work. Okay. So that's um, ways of working that we found helpful. And then about conceptual tools for practice as well. We realised uh, over time that a lot of what the ideas we're producing weren't always in a format that policy and practice could take and use and make sense of immediately. And we very much saw that as our failures to be able to translate and communicate. So it took a lot of, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand what people need from our research and the context that they work in to try and help that co-development of, um, of, con of workable concepts and ideas, tools for practice, which does fit with the Bourdieu's and knowledge of the, of, the, of the theory being a tool for practice. So we've had various concepts and tools, but the one I, I want to just show, uh, focus and show today is the idea of the equity compass. So we came to this because we've done a lot of work around extending Bourdieu's notion of capital to this idea of science capital. And we found that it was getting really popular. Lots of people took it up in policy and practice, but we felt they were constant, there were misinterpretations. And in particular, there were deficit interpretations, which was not what we wanted. So we realized that what we weren't conveying was what we meant by a social justice mindset and what we meant by an equitable approach. So we worked with our partners um, on this project over three years to try and come up with a concept that people could apply to education um, and whether it's formal or informal science, edu in science education at this point, in this case, but to try and help explain what, what does it mean if you're doing equity and inclusion work to take that social justice mindset? How can we spell it out a bit more for people? So we went through lots of iterations over a long time with the content, the functionality of it and the language. But this slightly confusing diagram is what we've come up with. It's getting a bit redesigned. This, this is my shonky PowerPoint attempt at design. It's getting redesigned by designers visually. But the idea is we called it the equity compass because it's an, a tool to try and help orientate people to the different dimensions of inequality that they might, or inequity they might want to pay attention to in their policy or practice. So when we tried it out with physicists, they did point out to me, it's not a real compass because it has eight points, not one. This is true, it is not a real compass, but it's a metaphor for how might we orientate ourselves more equitably. So the idea is that there are these eight different dimensions you might need to think about and pay attention to. Um, for example, dimensions of power, whose interests, needs and values is a policy or practice in, what sort of approach does it take, does it take a deficit approach or an assets-based approach that values what underserved communities bring with them. Um, to what extent is it just 
trying to support individuals or is it also more collectively orientated to communities, to society? Um, the, the context, the organisation, for example, it's, it's within which the practice or policy is taking place, are equity issues a bit tokenistic, peripheral, minor, or are they major core permanent aspects of the organisation? So is it being done through a participatory approach? Is it being done to young people, for them or with them? And so on, right? is it short term or long term? Is it reinforcing existing differences and inequalities in, for example, capital, or is it compensating for them, or is it redistributing? So the idea is that Equity Compass gives you eight areas that are important to think about. It gives you reflective questions to help um, guide your thinking and reflection. It gives you these zones, so I think my next, I don't know, um, so you can map your practice on. The idea is it's also a practical tool, the practitioners we work with wanted something practical, so they could reflect and think, well, this program I'm doing here, or this course, or whatever it is, it sits about here for these different dimensions, and I think about it. So it gives you an idea of where you, you want to keep moving outwards, ever outwards is the idea, you can keep going forever. Um, Actual practice is never achieved and done, it's always in process. But also, it gives you a sense of over time you can map and remap and get a sense of I'm going in the right direction because that again was important for the people we're working with. They wanted a sense of am I going in the right way? Am I thinking about the right things? What else should I be thinking of? So it's kind of it's it's very much trying to be a research informed tool for practice. So it's trying to be helpful. So here are eight key dimensions that come from the literature and the research. Here are some reflective uh, questions to guide thinking. It helps you think about what the extent to which your practices and outcomes are equitable and helps you ask them about your progress. So we've used this with lots of different teachers and professionals. And I just wanted to give one example of how people have used it in practice. So this does come from the science world. Um, but it's very typical of what uh, lots of kids in primary and some secondary schools experience through these sort of STEM enrichment. There's a lot of STEM enrichment about. It's a huge sector, there's a lot of money and time put into it. And this particular class is a, a, is a year four primary class. Um, and they had this STEM professional come in for a one-off session. He's an engineer, um, he's represented here. This was not Dr. Bridges, uh, it's a senior, but it sort of represents the kind of person he, he was. He comes in, tells the class a bit about his job, um, asks, can anyone describe what a bridge is? The children give him ideas. He does a short PowerPoint about the importance of bridges, what maintenance they require. He tells them that arched bridges are much stronger than flat bridges. And then they have a lolly stick bridge activity um, where they have lolly sticks and they're told to make one flat bridge, one arch bridge, and they have toy cars and it's competition to see how many are supported on each. It's fairly typical. I've had people when I've presented it before come up and say, I'm Dr. Bridges. Um, they weren't the real Dr. Bridges, but there's a lot of this sort of thing about it. So if you're a STEM ambassador or professional doing this sort of thing, it's often seen as a really good hands-on, you know, this is what we do. Um, and the idea is that children, you know, plus points are children do learn a bit more about engineering. Um, they get to meet a STEM, a science, technology, engineering or maths professional, and it's a break from the norm. But when we look at it through the um, compass, a very a range of minus points. First was the children wasn't at, weren't that engaged or inspired. And looking at it on the compass, it, a lot of the sessions like that reinforce rather than disrupt dominant existing power relations and stereotypes, for example, of engineering and of engineers of engineering. It doesn't support children's critical agency in any way. Just a few quotes from the kids in that class. They come out saying, well, I think an engineer is a man who's good at maths and science and needs to be strong and make stuff. Dr. Bridges wasn't challenging any popular stereotypes there. Um, he was obsessed with bridges. He just really loved bridges. And to be fair, Dr. Bridges did really, really love bridges. He was absolutely passionate. And he, can, he very effectively conveyed that passion I think at one point he diverged into talking about door hinges, but mainly it was brick bridges. So in that respect, he, he conveyed that, but it didn't challenge any wider um, dominant power relations or norms. And it was okay, I guess, but I'm not the most massive fan of bridges. So we've used um, 
this kind of tool to work with professionals in these spheres to help them think a bit differently it's very hard often to think outside the norm but just to help them think through like where are the equity issues in that how could you and we've worked with a range of teachers and professionals to say how would you now tweak that session how could you improve that practice so we've um, worked not, not just with people doing outreach, but the whole range of centres um, and our practice partners say it's helped them. So there's a quote there from a science centre practitioner saying it's helped us to rethink our approach to working with underserved young people, particularly to introduce more participatory approaches and to better articulate where we want to be going. So it's helped us have support those conversations around who controls the curriculum, whose knowledge is getting represented and whose interest is any of this activity in. A lot of the activity serves the interests of the science pipeline. It's coming from government and industry interests about getting more engineers in the future. And we're saying, well, actually, maybe science shouldn't be the destination. It should be a vehicle towards the social justice goals of underserved communities. So what do your, these communities that you want to come actually want or need in life? How can you help them get to where they want to be going rather than them being bums on seats? Um, and Nicole, one of our zoo practitioners, says um, they found the compass has afforded him the ability to more formally, clearly and confidently assist others. And he's used it um, on various programmes and identified areas, how to improve the actual practice and ensure the sessions we run are more socially just. So the second one that was around pools, so the idea of how we can I'm particularly interested in how we translate sociological ideas into useful formats. And the third is thinking we've had to try and think more creatively about our outputs. And this again comes back to that point I raised at the start about the registers that we work in, the kind of language we use. And we think it's been useful to us to work in different registers. So the capacity to engage in dialogue and to engage with social action, I think, is restricted if discourse is limited to a single elite register. So I think you, we can understand notions of that sort of um you know very very academic impenetrable english is where i put it as being very seductive because they're practices of power often which are aligned with hegemonic masculinity whiteness middle classness and so on which do generate status for those who can speak in this way we know as academics that if we do a you know an amazingly jargon heavy uh quite dense presentation it gives us privilege and status um but these practices can also entail a silencing of others. So I'm not trying to get rid of academic language altogether. I'm just saying that we've got to, I think we, the practice of challenging um, injustices requires understanding and, uh, and challenging your own privilege. And I think it's, as, I talk about it sometimes it's a zero sum game of equity. Everyone doesn't win. We have to dismantle privilege if we actually want to make a difference to, to injustices. So it does mean we have to look at those things that give status and, and me, mitigate media and look at ways that we can dismantle that. So accessible public facing registers, those grounded in experiences of oppression, often get denigrated, this notion of dumbing down or they get excluded. And so there's just a quote there from Patricia Hill Collins saying, you know, press groups are frequently placed in the situation of being listened to only if we frame our ideas in the language that's familiar to and comfortable for a dominant group. So why are we so attached to very elite forms of academic language? This requirement often changes the meaning of our ideas and works to elevate the ideas of dominant groups. I wouldn't say we, we've practiced this. Obviously, we really like to publish academic uh, uh, journal articles, but we have been trying to experiment with different formats and different registers. So from the usual reports to teacher handbooks, uh, as I mentioned before, and we've needed help to help write those, uh, even, though, even when we think we're being clear as academics, when we work with our teacher colleagues, they really point out that we haven't been clear at all. And um, so needing, you know, we can't write those sorts of things on our own. We've also experienced, uh, experimented with these sorts of animation, which are quite fun. We have little two minute drawn animations of some of our key concepts or ideas. I think this one is a, a teaching approach. We've got one coming out soon on the campus. Um, videos, social media, um, and really using these to try and engage with issues of translation, get our messages closer to a usable form. And I'd say doing all of these, whilst they're quite fun as well, it's really made us be more precise. I realised myself how often it's very easy to hide imprecision behind jargon. Uh, well, I'm saying jargon, you know, in academic terms, I feel I know what I'm saying, but when you have to translate it, it suddenly shows up a whole range of things that 
actually there's quite a lot of, sometimes in precision it can be quite a a, a shorthand way for us to work a long long the long hand ends up being a shorthand so it's really made us be much more precise but actually what does that mean obviously there are ongoing challenges interpretations can differ we've had various interpretations of some of our outputs like the teaching approach as i said some deficit interpretations which has helped us try and be more precise or more articulate it better um, the simpler and more succinct the message the more effective it often is but also the greater the scope for misinterpretation so it's a constant balancing act um, there's also been resistance to some of our messages i would say sometimes we have incredibly clear policy messages about what should change but it can fundamentally challenges elitism and the status quo so those are not popular we don't get work done taken up uh, appropriation uh, as well and i say partnership is an ongoing process that needs to be reflectively worked out i think we have really effective useful partnerships but they they you don't just have a partnership and that's it you have it, it's a constant process and, and work and obviously covid as everyone will have experienced has really challenged partnership working not just the practicalities but when most of our partners are furloughed their institutions are facing incredible financial uh, challenges as well so to conclude um i'd like to argue that or hopefully i have argued that taking a social justice stance in sociology of education research and practice can be really helped by working in sort of collaborative participatory ways trying to make a difference and i think it's possible for sociology of education to be both the critical secretary to society and to work with others to be the critical servant for society as well to provide critical service we've found it useful and valuable to rethink the way we work to try and reimagine that um, both how we work with partnerships what we produce the ideas and formats and the registers that we work in and i was supposed to conclude i say that practice is challenging but in our view definitely worth it so if you are interested in our projects there's just some notes uh, because they i'm happy to share the powerpoint but i'll stop there for questions and i'll try and stop screen sharing okay. excellent thank you very much louise uh, for this really uh, great uh, keynote uh, talk we are doing also extremely well time wise so uh, over to you guys uh, to ask as many questions as you can um, maybe use the raise your hand uh, button um, so that we can take one question after the other who would like to get us started Anyone? Please. I can't see any raised hands. Maybe I should be seeing them somewhere. Mm. You're looking for where to raise the hand. It's at the bottom of the participant screen on the right hand side, there's a symbol. Or just unmute yourself as well. You're currently all muted. Oh yeah, Agata has the hand raised. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, <laughs> I have one uh, technical question and one remark. Uh, mm, technical question is how to uh, put a question uh, on questions and answers uh, function because I uh, when I open question and answers. I don't know how to write anything, so I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, but um, as as uh, I'm I'm speaking right now, I will use the opportunity to just uh, have one remark um, because uh, I really um, I am really so much into uh, practical applications, and I feel that. Um, uh, Actually, um, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, ask you, Louise, uh, what do you think about uh, the structural, uh, I would say, constraints in, within the academia itself um, that uh, that uh, kind of prevent us or drive us from practical applications? Uh, because at least in Poland, I feel they are not appreciated it's just something that is uh, perceived as uh, driving us away from uh, good publications and all the points that we should be getting so 
each time we are presenting at a teachers conference or we are uh, engaging in collaboration with uh, NGOs. Uh, it's something that is kind of, how to say, on the side. So what do you think about this structural constraint? Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really important point. And I think it's, it comes back to the idea of what gets, what gets measured gets valued in any system. And I think that in, in, in the UK, we ha in England, we've had this, a shift to a, an alleged valuing of what's called impact, which has made a difference because that gets counted now in our big research assessment exercises, although often framed in a slightly sort of narrow, particular way, let's say, which, which has various issues to it. But I do think that irrespective of the way it's been framed, it has opened up a legitimacy in a space for saying this sort of work does get valued because it can literally count for money for universities. So universities are now very interested in it and do facilitate it more. I mean, I do agree that a lot of the time it has felt, it does feel on the side, what you do doing these activities is on the side. And when we've been able to integrate them into high quality research publications as well, that's when you kind of also get legitimacy for that. So again, I suppose using the compass as the notion of, thinking about what gets dominantly valued, it does feel that where it's, the value is placed on one narrow elite register of academic journal articles, then all of these other things around making a difference get pushed to the side. So uh, I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying that I hope the impact agenda comes to Poland, but <laughs> because I think the ways that it gets configured in these big high stakes audits, uh, you know, is, is problematic too. But I do think it's, it needs that shift to valuing making a difference, to see it as a part of the legitimate part of your work that we should be, you know, as academics, really we should, I think we should be, you know, public intellectuals, we absolutely should be spending time on these activities. And how can we do research divorce from society without those relationships? But equally, I suppose I would throw the onus back to the universities as to what, uh, and, and the governments as well, as to why is what we're valuing so narrow? Why is it more important to have a a paper in a journal that a very few people read rather than making a difference to people's lives. Okay, um, just on the technical side of things here, I should have been more specific there earlier on. Those that are panelists, so they are presenting the keynotes, uh, the paper presenters, etc. We can actually not use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions, so we need to raise our hands. So if you click on the raise hand button there, um, that's how we uh, uh, sort of raise attention and then I call you out uh, one by one. Those that are external attendees not presenting, and there's quite a few as well here in the list, they are the only ones who have the Q&A function. So uh, they use the Q&A function. That's the, um, that's the way to go forward. But there is a, a question there now. So Tiago Bogosian is saying here, um, thanks for the presentation, Luis. It's been really inspiring. Do you see sociology of education still looking too, too much at educational attainment and outcomes based on class, gender, race, and so forth, and not enough on more broader issues? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, I still think I've got several parts to answer. I think there are still severe in, injustices in terms of outcomes and attainment that deserve still highlighting and looking at. Um, but I do think we also, there are many broader issues as well that we need to look at too. So I think that the, the beauty of sociology of education is it looks in the round at things. But I think also in terms of the outcomes and attainment issues, I still think there's been too much focus, both not just in sociology of education, but also in policy and practice, on framing these in terms of gaps. Um, I mean, you know, at the moment in the UK, we're constantly talking about the gap in attainment, the, the gap that's growing between um, rich and poor kids through COVID uh, and so on. Whereas I think Gloria Ladsing Billings way of reframing that as a debt is much more powerful and important. So in a way, I'd like to see sociology education using that concept more and saying, well, actually, what happens when we reconceptualize it as a debt and not a gap? It refocuses where the onus is. It's not the blaming the underserved groups or, or looking at them in those sort of victim terms, but it's saying this is created through injustices that benefit the privilege. What do we owe to them? And how, it just helps reframing it in a really, really helpful way. So I'd like to see more of that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, there's another question here externally from Coletta. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I joined in a bit late, but just wondering what your thoughts are on decolonizing education. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for raising that. Yes. So I would say as part of um, the way of shifting how we think about equity and social justice, decolonizing is a key curriculum is a key part of that. So the notions of whose knowledge, what knowledge, how we teach and learn. Um, and I see that as an important part of if we're moving on the power axis of the compass, I don't know if you saw that bit or not, but from the reproduction through to the transformation. So I think the decolonizing um, work that's been going on and the movements there have been really, really hopeful and important. Okay, do we have other questions from the panelists, external attendees? Now's your chance. Here is one. Oh yeah, no, that was just, thank you, Louise, much appreciated. Coletta responding again. <laughs> Anybody else who'd like to come in? Hi, Daniel, can I come in on that? Oh yes, you can. Bernie here. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, thanks a million, Louise. I've really enjoyed that. I've been taking notes here furiously. So I'm glad to stop, to stop scribbling for a minute. Um, and thanks to the questioners as well. They were really, really interesting questions and your answers are really thought provoking. I suppose with regard to what the Provost Patrick Prendergast said earlier about the COVID-19 things and the things that we're, we're going to have to reimagine. You just mentioned, for example, in your answer to Coletta that you, we have to reimagine how we teach and learn. And that's sort of my, my specialty, if you like. So I'm really thinking about that in terms of COVID-19. And I'm not asking you to be the, to be the oracle, but can you see any clear ways in which teaching and learning can, can really evolve and go forward from this? And obviously from your point of view, maybe the specialty in science, capital and science education. Thanks. Yeah, like it's, a, it's a hard one, isn't it? Um, mm. It feels like, I think the combination of COVID, Black Lives Matter, you know, we've had several movements that I think have really helped in a, it's tra tragic that we've had to, uh, you know, that we've had, a lot of the experiences but has really helped move issues of justice and equity into the foreground and I think the notion of definitely white privilege I don't think we've had a moment like this where people have been so um, both impelled to and ready to engage with it so I think we, we have an opportunity um, and also I think it intersecting with the climate justice movement as well so it does feel like we're at that moment um, and I, I guess it depends whether you kind of go down a, a Borgesian or a Frarian <laughs> route with mm -hmm. it. Um, I'd like to be hopeful um, that there's impetus and I'm willing, and I think particularly the involvement of young people in politics in, you know, in, in democratic movements and social action has been really important here. I'm always slightly worried from a Borgesian point of view, we know that when we, when we push on power, power can be slippery and can push, will push back and will try and close these things down. Um, and I suppose the, the predominance of um, right-wing populist uh, politics across the world doesn't lend hope to that. Um, but I, it feels like there should be opportunities to rethink and change. And my concern would be that they just get pushed down a more technical agenda of, oh, well, let's do, you know, this is how we do online learning better yeah. or more, more efficiently. I think bigger. again, yes, bigger, mm. cheaper. Mm. And I think the notion of what better is gets subverted. Um, yeah. So I, I am hopeful, but also uh, concerned that it, yes. I, we wouldn't want the moment to get enough sort of shut down because then also there's that, I, you know, the way that, privilege works is then you know dominant society says well we've done that we've yes. taken that you know we've had that moment yes. yeah that's very interesting um, and, and going back to that thank you um but going back to what you said at the beginning i have it here in my notes highlighted and circled you've you've talked about black feminist politics and hope and love and i was thinking as you said it what a lovely thing to begin with because you know we in the the, the 13 of us on the executive committee we, we kicked around titles way before covid 19 we were kicking around titles for the once we had a theme which was was dear to our hearts inclusive education uh, but we kicked around titles and we, we went for what we have which is inclusive education in society in a time of change theories policies and practices and that's very much within the 
the, the framework of the sociological academic language that you talk about, which has its functions and, and works very well in a very closed society. But of course, we want to broaden it up and be more inclusive. And maybe we should have had a sub subtitle of Hope and Love. It might have been a really nice way. Looking forward now, the way that this conference has, has evolved to be this new thing, um, by, 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 not by choice for sure, but, but by necessity, um, maybe Hope and Love would have been a way to, to really think, you know, something good can come out of something truly awful, which is the ongoing COVID-19 yeah. disaster. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, th I think I think that's, I, I completely agree. I think the notion of reframing in terms of hope and love mm. and debt are yeah. powerful and important. And I think also speak to a more humanising agenda. I think the, the power of neoliberalism is it constantly, constantly strips out the humanising, doesn't it? You yes. know, we stop seeing people as fully human. We stop thinking of education as to what are we educating young people for? Yeah. Is it just for the economy and jobs yeah. or, you know, actually, for, if we're thinking, if we reframe the out, the outcomes that we want from education as, you know, agency, change, care, Empowerment. love, fully, mm. humanized, fully human people, then it makes us, it, it would, we would then look at our systems and say, well, hang on, that's not producing that, is it? No, indeed. Indeed. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. We have other questions. Anybody? Okay, that does not seem to be the case. So thanks very much, Luis, for really excellent uh, keynote. Um,